and will be available afterwards at the uh, We Are Quebec and the QCGN Language Rights uh, website. Um, so it's my pleasure this evening uh, to introduce um, a friend and colleague, Marion Sandylands, uh, for the, our inaugural webinar on a short history of language rights in Canada. Uh, Marion was born in Montreal and spent her formative years in Hemingford, Dunham, and Chambly. She's a graduate of McDonald Cartier High School in St. Hubert, now Heritage High School, part of Riverside uh, School Board. She completed her undergraduate and law degrees at McGill University. After her call to the bar, Marion served as a law clerk at the Supreme Court of Canada. She now practices law at Conway Litigation in Ottawa. Her practice encompasses civil litigation, constitutional and administrative law. Marion has acted for civil society organizations, school boards, parliamentarians, and Indigenous clients. Marion has appeared before the Supreme Court of Canada on matters of constitutional law and teaches Canadian federalism at the University of Ottawa. Uh, so thanks for being with us tonight, Marion, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'll just wait a minute or two for the PowerPoint to get up and then we can dive right in. Thanks. So just to set up the context, there seems to be a lot going on with language politics at the moment. Both the federal and provincial governments have recently announced overhauls to their language policy. Frankly, it's looking a little dicey out there at the moment. So my job today is to help us think about the following. Slide, please. How did we get here? But first, I'll situate myself. As Joanne Poirier of McGill University has said, in the language conversation in Canada, nobody is neutral. So my story, I grew up in the 80s and 90s as an English speaker in the Shadgy Valley, in the townships, and later on the South Shore. Um, to give you my exact age, I was a teeny bopper uh, at, at the moment of the 1995 referendum. So that event really marked me, I would say, for life. And now, as a lawyer, it turns out I specialize in constitutional law and language rights. Go figure. Slide, please. And as a good lawyer, oh, slide. I like to start everything off with a caveat. I'm a lawyer, not a historian. So I'll be telling the story with a little lawyer's twist. And obviously, I can't cover the entire subject matter in half an hour. Um, but I'm going to take a very Quebec-centric view of this Canadian history of language rights. Why? I often hear that English speaking Quebec feels squeezed out or forgotten in conversations about official languages, both in Quebec City and in Ottawa. But the way I tell the story, Quebec's English speaking population has actually been pretty central in the unfolding of language rights in Canada. But is that about to change? Next slide, please. Well, let's take a trip back in time and see how we got here. So today I'll take us through a timeline and I'll hit on some of the big milestones for language rights. Let's get started. But where do we start? How far back should we go? How about time immemorial? Slide please. Often we tell the story about dueling languages in Canada, English and French, but that's not the whole story. We have to talk first about indigenous languages. So English and French were brought here um, by French and British settlers. Neither English nor French has ever been the universal language in this territory. In fact, no language, no single language has ever been universally spoken here. Before the settlers arrived, indigenous languages were spoken. Today, there are roughly 70 indigenous languages spoken in Canada. There would have been a lot more at the time of contact. As a legacy of residential schools, these indigenous languages are fast disappearing. Today, only about 260,000 Canadians can speak an indigenous language. And I'll pick this up again at the end of my presentation today because it's part of the national conversation now about language rights. Next slide, please. So I'll skip now to uh, Nouvelle France, the French colony uh, in the 1500s, 1600s, up till 1763. This was a colony of France um, with French settlers. 
Um, and they brought with them the French civil law, Catholicism, and the French language, of course. And that was the case for about 200 years in the place now known as Quebec. Next slide, please. And this all changed, of course, in 1763 um, with the British conquest of New France, actually. The Plains of Abraham battle, 1759, and 1763, the Treaty of Paris. Um, ending a big war between the European powers. And one result of this was that New France was ceded to the British. So we have a change in colonial government. Nouvelle France becomes the British province of Quebec. And at this point, the English speaking Protestant British find themselves in charge of a French speaking Catholic population. And the Treaty of Paris and the Royal Proclamation granted some freedom of religion for the Catholic faith, um, but there is no specific protection for the French language. And generally at this point, it's the, it, this was an assimilationist policy. British common law was supposed to replace the French civil law system. The institutional status of the Catholic church was removed. And if a colonist wanted to assume public office, they had to swear an oath of allegiance to King George and renounce their Catholic faith. But, this doesn't last very long. In the 1770s, things start to get very interesting in North America. Next slide, please. And again, please. So something's brewing in the 13 colonies south. Um, the Boston Tea Party, which is pictured on this slide here, was on December 16th, 1773, followed by a Declaration of Independence in 1776. Now, I wonder which European power, perhaps an enemy of Britain, who has recently lost its colonies in North America, might be likely to help the American colonies gain their independence. Hmm. This thought causes the British to revisit its colonial policy in Quebec. So then we get, in 1774, the Quebec Act, a change in policy. In addition to creating a legislative body for the first time, the Quebec Act reinstates French civil law. It allows for the Catholic Church to retain its status, and it affirms the freedom to practice the Catholic faith, including in public office. This is quite different from what we had in the Royal Proclamation. So the Quebec Act permits the British to rule over the French settlers by permitting the French settlers to retain their autonomy and their identity. Rather than trying to assimilate, this is a new policy. It allows distinct groups in colonial society to coexist. What's the result? Well, in the Battle of Quebec in 1775, the American Revolutionary troops try to take Quebec City and they don't succeed. The French speaking subjects of Quebec remain loyal to the British crown. Okay. I know what you're thinking. You thought this was a webinar about language rights. So why am I talking so much about colonial policy in the 1700s? Well, this is the story of why we have language rights at all in Canada today. And the Quebec Act, as I see it, is the first glimmer of a national policy that is essentially still in place today. The Quebec Act doesn't actually contain language rights but it's the policy that grounds a lot of the language rights that we see developing later on. But in the interests of time, I'll speed it up. So we'll head now into what I call the pre-Confederation period and things are changing. We have English speaking settlers coming in um, to Quebec from the United States and, and from Britain. And they're coming into, into the province and they're moving west. The demographics are changing. So at one point, the French speaking settlers were the majority, but that is gradually over time going to shift and flip over. And this is also a period of experimentation with different political structures in these colonies, trying to find a political system that's actually going to work for a society that's increasingly dualistic. Next slide, please. So in 1791, we get the Constitutional Act, which creates two separate colonies, Upper and Lower Canada. And the map is on the slide here. And it's two separate legislatures, so they can be controlled by the French majority in Lower Canada and the English speaking majority in Upper Canada can each control their own legislative assembly. And there are some rights to use French in the legislatures. 
Uh, unfortunately, this has limited success. We have the rebellions in the 1830s in Upper and Lower Canada, followed by the Durham Report. And Lord Durham is called in to make recommendations of how to avoid uh, future rebellions. And he makes two big proposals. The first one is for uh, responsible government. So in plain language, a, a strengthened democracy. And the second main proposal he makes, um, and for us is far more interesting, uh, is the union of Upper and Lower Canada. Why? To force the assimilation of the French speakers, who would then find themselves in the minority within this united colony. And he thought that would solve the rebellions problem. Next slide, please. So uh, in partially implementing this recommendation, we get the Union Act of 1840, which unites Upper and Lower Canada into one province of Canada with one legislative assembly. And English is to be the sole language of that assembly. So we have a, a backtracking on the, the rights for French language. But this requirement was walked back in 1848 in the face of some protest. But anyway, this, this system was unstable. There were many changes of government during this period. Um, so yet again, we're seeing the failure of these assimilationist policies. Next slide, please. And that brings us to Confederation, the Constitution Act 1867. Here we see the great constitutional bargain, federalism. So the federalist system that's created at Confederation allows for the joining of four colonies or three colonies, I guess, into one dominion with a federal parliament and government, but also provincial parliaments and governments. Power is divided between federal and provincial levels. The provinces get jurisdiction over property and civil rights, purely local matters, hospitals, and education, among many other things. So this setup creates the space for the Catholic French-speaking majority in Quebec to retain some autonomy and political clout within the province, including for the use of the French language. And at the same time, the recipe here also includes some special ingredients that are designed to protect um, the rights of the English-speaking minority that has existed inside the province of Quebec. For example, section 133 of the Constitution Act 1867 provides that both English and French can be used in the federal parliament and in the legislature of Quebec and in the courts of Canada and Quebec and Quebec, and that the laws of both Canada and Quebec are to be published in English and French. So what does this do? This allows French to be spoken in the parliament of Canada and in federal courts, but it also allows English to be spoken in Quebec's legislative assembly and in the courts in Quebec. And note that this guarantee is asymmetrical. The Constitution Act doesn't guarantee the use of the French language in the legislature or courts of any other province, only Quebec. So there's nothing in there for the French speakers outside of Quebec. Another example is Section 93 of the Constitution Act 1867, which protects minority denominational schools in all province. So in Quebec, this would protect the Protestant, which would be mainly English speaking schools. And outside of Quebec, it protected the Catholic schools, which were both French and English. It maps fairly well onto language in Quebec, but not quite as well outside Quebec. And it doesn't directly protect the language of education. Now, federalism generally favors the linguistic majorities within each province. But the result that the, the upshot is that it traps the minorities that are within the provinces. So what do I mean by that? Well, there were some rights for English speakers within Quebec in this bargain, but the federalist system created no rights for the use of the French language outside of Quebec, except for its use in the federal parliament. And Confederation and the Federalist system created space inside Quebec for the French language and French culture and identity. But elsewhere, it enabled policies of assimilation of both the French speakers and Indigenous peoples. So the, I don't need to go into depth on, on assimilation of Indigenous peoples. We have um, the territorial expansion after Confederation, residential schools started up around this time, and we know the legacy of that. But what we might know less is the policies of assimilation towards French speakers outside of Quebec. For example, Regulation 17 in Ontario, Reglement 17, 
That was in place from 1912 to 1927. What did it do? It restricted French as a language of instruction in Ontario. After grade two, students, including Francophone students, were permitted only one hour per day of instruction in French. And the rest of the instruction had to be in English. So the clear goal here was assimilation of Francophones. Bilingual schools in Ontario were, were recognized after this regulation was, was taken back in 1927, but Francophone schools were not officially recognized until 1968. But let's move on. Next slide, please. And again, please. So we'll fast forward to the 60s, because this is where the storm is really starting to brew in Canada. Language politics really heats up in a big way. So what's happening? Well, it's the quiet revolution in Quebec. Quebec's Francophone majority is looking around. It's looking at Ottawa and even Montreal, and it doesn't see itself reflected in the leadership of the federal institutions. It starts to demand rights and recognition. So then Prime Minister Lester Pearson establishes the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, also known as the Laurent Dunton Commission. In its preliminary report, the commission makes no bones about the problem that language could pose to the Canadian Federation itself. It says, and I quote, Canada without being fully conscious of the fact is passing through the greatest crisis in its history. The source of the crisis lies in the province of Quebec. If it should persist and gather momentum, it could destroy Canada, unquote. Among the Commission's recommendations were the formal recognition of two official languages, English and French. Next slide, please. And so we get, in 1969, Parliament enacts the Official Languages Act. The Act formally declares that Canada has two official languages. It then provides specific rights with regard to official languages at the federal level. Remember, this is federal legislation. It provides legislative and judicial bilingualism at the federal level. It provides rights to receive federal services in both official languages, and it creates a federal commissioner of official languages. I'll just stop here and give a plug for the webinar in two weeks, where we will have Graham Fraser, who is himself uh, the former commissioner of official languages of Canada. And he's going to speak just about the Official Languages Act. So tune in for that. But anyway, back to my talk. Canada, do we ride off into the sunset after the passage of the Official Languages Act? No, unfortunately, it's not going to be enough. Quebec nationalism continues to build momentum and Quebec is slowly building its own language policy. Next slide, please. So in 1977, the Parti Québécois in Quebec enacts Bill 101, the Charter of the French Language. This is provincial legislation. It makes French the official language of Quebec. The goal is to make French the face of Quebec and the working language in the province. It sets out a sweeping set of rules designed to promote the French language within the province in both public and private life. It deals with a host of things, the language of the legislature, the language of government, signs, labels, language of work, labor relations, business contracts. It remains to this day by far the most comprehensive language legislation in Canada. And federalism allows for this. The Charter of the French language also includes restrictions on who can attend English language schools. These restrictions are aimed at ensuring that newcomers to the province would assimilate into French rather than English. Now there will be also a whole separate webinar on the Charter of the French language, so I won't say more about it today, but I did want to say one thing, and that's this. As a matter of law, the Charter of the French language could not and cannot override the language rights that are enshrined in the Constitution. Quebec's Charter of the French Language, for example, could not take away the rights that were in the 1867 Constitution and could not override the Charter of Rights and Freedoms when it came into force in 1982. That's why to this day, the Charter of the French Language itself provides that the laws of Quebec are to be published in English and French, that English may be used in Quebec courts, and despite whatever tradition and whatever the Charter of the French language says or doesn't say, there's still a constitutional right to use English in the National Assembly of Quebec. Next slide, please. 
And Quebec's um, nationalism movement builds momentum and the climax, of course, is the first sovereignty referendum in 1980. Um, of course, it was unsuccessful and Quebec remained part of Canada. Next slide, please. And then we hit 1982, two years after the sovereignty referendum. The government of Ottawa is very busy doing its own nation building. So uh, 1982, Canada patriots its constitution and we get the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, albeit without the consent of Quebec. With the charter, official bilingualism is now constitutionally enshrined. If you look at the charter, which is up on the slide here, um, I've highlighted the language rights in there. And you can see it's a good third of the document. It's just devoted to language rights. The first 15 sections of the charter look a lot like human rights charters around the world. Fundamental freedoms, legal rights, etc. But the language rights part are very special to Canada. And they're not subject to the famous notwithstanding clause that's in the charter which means they cannot be overridden by any legislature. The language rights in the charter deal with, well, of course, official languages at the federal level. So the status of the two official languages, French and English, legislative bilingualism, uh, judicial bilingualism, communications by the federal institutions and providing services to the public in both official languages. There are also some special provisions for um, bilingualism in New Brunswick. And finally, section 23 of the charter sets out minority language education rights. These are the rights to have one's children educated in the minority language in the province. So in English in Quebec and in French outside of Quebec. This provision means that the provinces actually, because provinces have jurisdiction over education, it's the provinces that are obliged to set up and maintain primary and secondary education facilities in the minority language and that the minority community has the right to manage and control these institutions. The Supreme Court has recognized the importance of education for minority language communities, as well as the link between education, language, and culture. The court has called these rights, Section 23 rights, called them the quote, linchpin of Canada's commitment to bilingualism. And although the Charter of Rights and Freedoms sets out a very different version of language from Quebec's policy, the Charter of the French language, the charter, the, light, the rights in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms were themselves influenced by Quebec's policy and by the Charter of the French language itself. The language of section 23 of the charter regarding which categories of people have the entitlement to education in the minority language was with one exception lifted directly out of Quebec's charter of the French language. So here again, we see constitutional rights in Canada at large being shaped by language politics and law within Quebec. In fact, the first charter challenge under section 23 was brought by um, the Quebec Association of Protestant School Boards. And this was a challenge to the provisions of the Charter of the French Language that limited the eligibility for English education more than the new Charter of Rights and Freedoms guaranteed. So that famous conflict between the Quebec Clause and the Canada Clause. And they won at the Supreme Court of Canada. Next slide, please. So what comes next? In 1988, um, because of the new rights that are enshrined in the Charter from 1982, uh, in 1988, the Official Languages Act itself needed a facelift because uh, to implement the new charter rights. And this is the first and only major update to the Official Languages Act to this day. And this rewrite was exhaustive. I won't steal Graham's thunder by going over all the new things in the Official Languages Act, but he will get into that at the next webinar, I'm sure. But most notably for our purposes, the updated act introduced the concept of the English and French speaking linguistic minority communities. One of the stated purposes of the Official Languages Act is to quote, support the development of English and French linguistic minority communities. And the act declares that the government of Canada is quote, committed to enhancing the vitality of the English and French linguistic minorities communities in Canada. Unquote. 
Now, there's only one province with an English speaking official language minority. So without mentioning Quebec specifically, the Official Languages Act necessarily recognizes the English speaking minority of Quebec. So 11 years after Quebec's Charter of the French language, the Official Languages Act extends a lifeline to English speaking Quebec. It's a federal law that says to English speaking Quebec, and in fact, all official language minorities, we see you, you matter. But we still do not ride into the sunset after this. The painful, constitutionally, the painful constitutional history continues through the 90s. Next slide, please. Meech Lake, Charlottetown, second Quebec referendum, Clarity Act. By this point, Canada is constitutionally exhausted. Slide, please enough. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Next, please. So first of all, I want to talk again about Indigenous language rights because they are re-emerging. So at this point, no provinces recognize Indigenous language rights. But all three territories include indigenous languages, either as official languages or they accord some language rights for those uh, indigenous languages. So Nunavut, there are three official languages, actually English, French, and Inuktitut. And in fact, Inuktitut is the majority language in Nunavut. In the Northwest Territories, there are actually 11 official languages, English, French, and nine specific indigenous languages. In the Yukon, it's a bit different. English and French are the official languages, but there's recognition in the law that indigenous languages could be support, should be supported. And there's a right to use any, quote, Yukon Aboriginal languages in the legislative debates. From the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, number 13, 14, and 15 call for the re recognition and support of Aboriginal language and culture. In response to that call to action, in 2019, Parliament passed the Indigenous Languages Act. First time this kind of legislation has been passed. This act seeks to support and revitalize Indigenous languages in Canada. It recognizes that languages are part of uh, Aboriginal rights under the Constitution. Um, the act itself doesn't have a lot of teeth but it permits the government to support Indigenous languages. It has some provisions for services and translation, but they're pretty weak. And it does create a, a commissioner of Indigenous languages. It does not define or list Indigenous languages, and it doesn't make any language an official language. But it's something new. It's new language rights that weren't there before. And I see this as it's part of reconciliation and it's part of our nation building in the 21st century. So it's now it's in the mix. History tells us that language rights are never just technical. They are about identity, autonomy, nation building. And they tend to be forged in times of constitutional crisis. It's usually painful and it's always political. Now, when it comes to English and French and constitutional crisis for that matter, we now appear to be in some kind of 20 year old constitutional ceasefire. Next slide. But something's bubbling. The CAC government has announced plans to introduce reforms to the charter of the French language. What will these be? We don't know yet. There's also a lot of saber rattling in Ottawa at the moment. The government of Canada is working on its own official languages reform. And the Quebec government has published a position on the federal reform. And in a nutshell, Quebec wants Canada to defer to Quebec in all matters of language within the province. And the government of Canada has now unveiled its white paper for reform. And it's very focused on remedial measures to support the French language. But it also looks to be introducing an asymmetry into the Official Languages Act that isn't there right now. And this is extremely worrying for English-speaking Quebec. 
The white paper also does mention the importance of indigenous languages. So this is now part of the conversation. How does it all fit together? So some serious questions are being raised. The debate's opening up, the politics are heating up. Will English speaking Quebec continue to be recognized under a reformed official languages act? Will we lose a lifeline from Ottawa? And what's coming with Quebec's reform? What would happen if both levels of government reform their language policy at the same time? Next slide, please. Where is this all going? So why it's important for English speaking Quebecers to be in the loop here, be part of the conversation. English speaking Quebec may yet again need to defend its place as an official language minority or else risk getting lost in the shuffle. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And I'll flip it back to you, Stephen. I'm back. I'm back. Uh, thanks, Marion. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, I really appreciate uh, your presentation on a short history of language rights in Canada. Uh, we got a few questions uh, in the chat. Um, I would invite folks to uh, to put any questions you have in the chat. Um, we'll spend the next little bit answering them. If we can't get around to answering your question during this uh, during tonight's webinar, um, we'll do our best to follow up with you afterwards. Um, there were some quest specific questions around uh, education and health um, that are specific to Quebec and specific to the uh, Charter of the French Language. Um, just so everybody knows, we're going to be holding spe uh, web unique webinars on those subjects later on in the series. So we'll hold those questions, those specific questions, um, until later, until we have our webinar on, lang on uh, uh, language and health rights and language and education rights specific to Quebec. Marion, um, there was some confusion, um, and you'll appreciate this as an English-speaking Quebecer. Um, when people like us talk about the Charter, we're talking about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. To the average Quebecer, the word Charter means the Charter of the French language. So the, I think there was some confusion around the notwithstanding clause and what the heck is that? And does that trump things that are in the Charter of the French language? And what are we talking about? Could you just talk a little bit more about the notwithstanding clause, what its purpose is, and what it applies to? I'd be happy to. What a, thank you for that question. Um, I myself uh, was confusing a little bit with my use of the word charter, because as a constitutional lawyer, usually when I'm talking about the charter, I mean the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But of course, there's the Charter of the French Language, and of course, the Quebec Charter itself, which we're not talking about tonight. But that wasn't the question. So the notwithstanding clause is part of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And it says that certain rights in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, can be, a legislature can override those rights by, by declaring that this legislation applies notwithstanding charter rights. So for example, Quebec has recently done that with Bill 21, um, the religious symbols ban, they have included in Bill 21 an invocation of the notwithstanding clause to say that notwithstanding the charter rights in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, this act will apply. Um, so that's that's part of the, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. What I was saying was that the language rights that are found in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms are not subject to the notwithstanding clause. So they cannot be overridden that way by a legislature. So including, so for example, if some if the Quebec legislature wanted to um, put in, in any law of the Quebec National Assembly, um, if they wanted to try to override um, rights, they could not override the rights, the language rights that are part of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Thanks, Marion. Marion, you brought up the, uh, the recent Government of Canada uh, paper on uh, their future approach to official languages. And I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on what, as an English-speaking English -speaking Quebecer, I should be concerned about um, in that paper. Mm, yes, I alluded to this quickly. I said it looks like it's it's uh, bringing an asymmetry into the Official Languages Act. I mean, we don't we don't yet know because they haven't tabled legislation yet. So we don't know what, if any, changes will be made to the Official Languages Act itself. What we have is a policy paper um, with with a, a whole bunch of reforms. Um, 
And the potential pitfall here for English speaking Quebec is that if the structure of the Official Languages Act changes such that it no longer recognizes um, the English speaking minority within Quebec as an official language minority, um, that would kind of it would kind of drop English speaking Quebec out of the act altogether. That's a bit alarmist. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that's a concern when we reopen that box. Um, the paper talked about, Government of Canada's paper talked a little bit about inserting interpretive clauses um, into the act that would recognize French as a minority language. And as a, as a constitutional lawyer, what might that kind of wording do uh, or what kind of effect would that wording have on our rights in the future of when we're litigating to protect our rights? So that's another way that asymmetry could find its way in and, and cause a problem in the future. So an interpretive clause, for example, that, that recognizes um, the important, that puts more emphasis on the preservation of French language, but, but doesn't put emphasis on um, official language minority communities, for example, might lead um, to an interpretation of rights for English speaking Quebecers that would be narrower than perhaps were previously appreciated. Um, they would be seen as less important, for example. Um, these are things, these are, these are problems that might creep in as the act would be applied in the future. Um, so first of all, it creates uncertainty, but second of all, it, it could erode, um, it erode some rights going forward. So this seems to me like, like a revisioning of the, of the model that was set up or um, uh, by the by and by commission in the late sixties. And it was seemed to sort of turn uh, federal Paul, the government of Canada's vision of official languages uh, quite the other way. That's, uh, that's my concern as well, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about education, um, not education rights in particular, but in general, um, the charter protects education rights uh, in section 23, um, but it doesn't say anything about health rights for linguistic minority communities or any other sort of institutions of, that are important to our, our communities. And I was wondering what, what's so special about education that it had that uh, that they that they uh, had to entrench uh, minority language minority education language rights in the charter. Hmm. The best I can do is guess. Um, the best I can do is guess. Uh, and if I was in a room full of people, I would probably ask someone to help me. But my guess is that um, the charter. Um, well, the Supreme Court has said. Um, that the Section 23 rights are remedial um, because at the time in 1982, um, well, we had the Charter of the French Language, which, which restricted eligibility to uh, minority English education. And this is some, I read Section 23 as a direct response to that by guaranteeing, um, by guaranteeing minority language education. And the Supreme Court has also referred to um, assimilationist policies like uh, Reglement Zisset as a reason why Section 23 education rights needed to be entrenched constitutionally. That's the answer I can give to that. Mary, you and I have spent an awful lot of time over the last um, number of years talking about uh, language rights and federally regulated businesses. Um, and so could you talk a little bit about what language regime applies to those businesses right now and um, what the uh, government is envisioning in its uh, position paper. Hmm. <laughs> so right now, the Charter of the French Language applies. This is going to get very federalism-y. The Charter of the French Language is provincial legislation. It applies only to um, private enterprises that are under provincial jurisdiction. And there are a group of private enterprises that are under federal jurisdiction rather than provincial. So those include banks, um, railways, telecommunications companies, and airlines. So a number of kind of large sectors of the economy that aren't subject to the Charter of the French language. And so the proposal right now is to somehow bring those private enterprises under some kind of federal um, legislative regime. Uh, and the policy purpose appears to be to ensure that workers in those industries in Quebec have the right to speak French at work. Um, this is constitutionally 
tricky. Um, there's some question as many people believe Quebec doesn't have the jurisdiction to do that, but it seems that Ottawa may be moving to try to put something in. And we don't know what that something is yet. They've just struck a committee of experts that's supposed to make recommendations about how this might work and what instruments could be used to put it in place. And just to clarify, the Official Languages Act does not apply to federally regulated businesses, correct? That's right. It, it applies only to the public service, federal institutions, and there are a couple of private enterprises that it applies to, for example, um, Crown Corporations and former Crown Corporations like Air Canada. So just a couple of private sector, but for the most part, it does not apply to the private sector. Brilliant. Okay, great. Um, we talked, uh, you talked and you, you sort of mentioned the quiet revolution, Quebec's quiet revolution in the 60s. And um, I think it's worth noting that there's a shift in the 60s uh, in Quebec from the Quebec identif uh, identif identifying sort of with religion and religion is, is a very big um, uh, factor in personal identification early on, right? The protection of the denominational school boards, Catholic, mm -hmm. Protestants. Uh, Protestant became code for English and everybody that wasn't French Catholic. And um, But the institutions uh, that were built uh, prior to the Quiet Revolution were built by communities, uh, schools, um, universities, colleges, uh, health and social services institutions. And those were sort of taken over by the state, uh, mm -hmm. in, right, by Quebec. And in, uh, what was it like, or what do you think the impact of that was on the English speaking community? I think my impression is that this has been sort of a slow burn starting from the 60s and right up to today. Um, the slow encroachment of, of the provincial civil service um, taking over step by step um, institutions in both uh, health and education. Um, I know more about the education side. So we see, I mean, as you said, Stephen, a lot of the original um, school board institutions would have been created sort of from the community level up, but gradually and gradually, the Ministry of Education takes more and more control over the system. And to the point now where we're at, where there have been several attempts to abolish school commissioners, abolish school boards themselves, and we have Bill 40 right now. Um, so it gradually encroaches onto that community institution building to the point where the community aspect of it almost disappears. Um, I wanna switch, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I seem to be bouncing a little bit, but I'm responding to the questions in the chat. We have an excellent question here about um, whether or not you think uh, asymmet what effect do you think asymmetry might have on francophone minorities outside Quebec? It depends on what it looks like. Um, but I would think that, for example, an interpretation clause um, that recognizes that Quebec is a minority, uh, sorry, that French is a minority language within Canada and within North America. So bringing the French language together, um, I think that would favor um, the generous interpretation of rights in favor of francophones outside of Quebec. Okay, great, thanks. I'm just gonna check here. Um, there was a proposal a few years ago by the uh, Parti Québécois, Pauline, Pauline Marois, and I can't remember the bill, 86, I think, I can't really remember off the top of my head, but to restrict access to SAGEPs, um, to apply Bill 101 to SAGEPs. Um, I know, I know you're, you're not prepared for this, but I'm just asking. If you think, uh, it seems to me that that was a constitutional issue too. That was a section two issue. Um, it's not strictly an, edu uh, an education right. Um, and maybe explain the limits of the section two or section 23 education, what that covers, what it doesn't cover. And whether or not you think um, that uh, a provincial government could restrict access uh, based on uh, language to uh, to the college system. Hmm. I could have, I should write a legal opinion about this, but I'll just answer quickly in ten seconds. So, uh, Section twenty three, the words of Section twenty three pretty clearly state that it's about primary and secondary education. 
Um, so it's pretty clear from the language of Section 23 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that that constitutional guarantee applies to primary and secondary education. Um, so from the wording of that, it doesn't look like it applies to, well, pre-primary, so um, preschool education. It doesn't look like it applies to that. And it doesn't look like it applies to post-secondary education. Now, legal scholars will debate with me about this and say that there is some some extension possible um, to protect post-secondary education, um, but that hasn't been tested at law yet, so we don't really know. So um, could a provincial government uh, potentially uh, extend the chart of the French language to CEGEPs? Without having done any research, I think perhaps they could. Okay, thanks. We have a really good question here from uh, Harold Stavis. Thanks, I hope you said your name wrong. Thanks, Harold. Um, and it gets to the question of uh, of, uh, core, of uh, a federally regulated business's core business. So the question is, why aren't there? Why are there? Um, could the I guess the, the the crux of the question is, could the Charter of the French Language apply to signage, public signage for the banks? Uh, that's a good question. What a what a great legal question. Um, Oh gosh. So the, 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 legal, the legal reason why the chart of the French language doesn't or can't apply to federally regulated undertakings is a doctrine in federalism called interjurisdictional immunity, which, which is the doctrine that says that, um, I call it the invisible fence of federalism. It's a doctrine that says that um, there's a core of each area of federal or provincial jurisdiction here, federal. So there's a core of some federal jurisdiction over these undertakings that cannot be penetrated by the province. So it's the invisible fence. So that's why your question is so difficult to answer. As it stands now, I think the understanding of the law is that it just doesn't apply at all to uh, federally regulated undertakings. But your question raises that important point, which is how far, where exactly does that line uh, sit and off the top of my head, I certainly don't know the answer, but it's a very interesting question. It is, and I just want to point out to, to everybody and uh, Harold that this question um, of the Charter of the French language and the use of French in federally regulated businesses in Quebec has been studied. There's an excellent Industry Canada study, uh, which you'll find on our, our website. Um, it covers a lot of a lot of these questions and the actual the actual situation of the use of French and in federally regulated businesses in Quebec. And it notes that a lot of these companies, uh, the charter banks, for example, voluntarily comply with the charter of the French language and have their, uh, their certifications already from the office on a voluntary basis. So um, a lot of this is what we're talking about here is very political, it's very hypothetical, um, but it's a minority government and it's possibly an election year. And so that's why. Um, oh, we have a question here. Uh, well, this is, this is the last question that we'll take. Um, and it's about, it's about eligibility to school. So I think we'll pass on that and answer that offline because it's going to require a little bit of expert from, uh, from an eligibility specialist. Um, Marion, I really want to thank you for, uh, for your time tonight. Um, one last question before I go is if you had one question, because you're, I'm now passing the baton to you as the moderator for the next, yeah. web, next webinar. And if you have one question to ask Graham Fraser, what would it be? I'd ask Graham Fraser, if you could change one thing about the Official Languages Act, what would it be? Good question. All right. Well, uh, thank you everybody uh, for coming tonight. Um, it's been great. We'd like to thank uh, Marion uh, for coming out. Yeah again you'll see her again in two weeks uh on march 25th and so back over to the boss um uh, to close it out thank you very much thank you so i told you that was a dry subject but a great presenter and lots of good questions um that will require uh, uh more uh, more work um I would like to say there are over a hundred people joined us this evening. Uh, tell your friends, um, look at the video again, uh, join us for the next seminar. Um, as they say in French, c'est un moment charnière. 
uh, for the community. It's a, a seminal, a pivotal moment for the English speaking community. And uh, we hope that our seminars will help you understand uh, better uh, what the challenges are and uh, what we can do about it. So stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Marion.